Module 14, Relational Summary Lecture GEE2, Planet of the Apes. The Eastern Hemisphere is traditionally thought of as comprising Africa, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. The Eastern Hemisphere is home sweet home for Homo sapiens. Now it's of note to our study that the ecology of the East is actually the ecology of the hominoids, which can otherwise be thought of as the planet of the apes. It was in this hemisphere, the East, that the ancestors of our kind, the gorillas, the chimpanzees, the bonobos, the orangutans, and the humans, these big five comprising the great apes, and the siamangs and the gibbons, these last two comprising the so-called lesser apes, found their home. Appearing first in the Miocene era some 25 million years ago, our tailless primate grandparents radiated out from Africa and traversed these four huge regions, making it as far as the Indonesian archipelago, with remnant populations of the once abundant orangs and gibbons restricted to the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. Legends of Bigfoot, or yetis, in the Himalayas harken back to a time when Gigantopithecus roamed. Gigantopithecus was a huge shaggy-haired ape that lived through the Ice Age in Tibet and China and only went extinct some 300,000 years ago. Quote, likely due to climate change and the retreat of preferred habitat and potentially archaic human activity by Homo erectus. Yeah, climate change and hunting was killing off charismatic megafauna back then, too. A much later, a mere 16,500 years ago by current reckoning, only one of those apes, Homo sapiens, extended its range to the Western Hemisphere, many by crossing the Bering Straits land bridge from Asia to Alaska that ice ages exposed when the sea level dropped. So we are relatively newcomers to the New World. Some monkeys had made it over previously, so there are other primates called New World monkeys, some with extraordinary prehensile tails, but there are no other apes, except in zoos. The ecology of the East is therefore somewhat unique, despite what I said earlier about ecological convergence. It's unique in that it has had a mind for a long time. Meditate on that with your mind and see if it doesn't give you some hope. Think of it this way. In McDonough and Braungart's mind-bending book, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking How We Make Things, a book printed on recycled plastic, by the way, so that you can do as I did and read it on the beach in a thermal bath or in the jacuzzi, McDonough twists us into thinking about the promise of industrial ecology by asking if anybody ever talks about an overpopulation of cherry trees or the problems of cherry blossoms littering the ground. The notion sounds absurd, doesn't it? And that's because we know that the more trees there are, the more oxygen we have, the more carbon we sequester, the more wildlife will flourish, the more our water will be purified and clean, the more rain we will have, the more soil we will build, the more fruit and, uh, fruits we'll have in food. It never occurs to us to complain about too many cherry trees or the falling of too, too many cherry blossoms. Now amplify the argument to include fig trees and avocado trees and mangoes, persimmons and Further east, mangosteen and durian trees. Trees, trees with magnificent flowers and giant, often fatty fruits. The more we have in a smaller location, the more we would describe it as the Garden of Eden. We wouldn't complain things were getting too crowded, would we? Crowded with trees? When I was doing my research in the Far East, in the Gunung Palum Nature Reserve, in the primary rainforests of Kalimantan Barat, western Borneo, we documented at least 700 different species of trees in a single hectare of space. But we never called it overcrowded or lamented the leaf litter. These magnificent forests, which are sadly now all being converted to a single monocrop plantation of African oil palm for trivial commodities like cosmetics and ice cream and candy, were a riot of life forms, some of the highest biodiversity rates on the earth. The more trees and the more varieties of trees there were, the more animals dazzling displays of avian plumage with splendidly diverse beaks and all sorts of furry things with fingers and toes and teeth to carve out new niche space and parse the world ever more finely so that ever more life could be packed in. It was a paradise. But who planted that garden? Who kept it seeded with an ever-increasing variety and abundance of fruiting and flowering trees and shrubs? And where did those big, protein-rich and lipid-rich fruits and nuts that sustain human life come from? Why, from the hominids, creatures that are human-like, from us, from the long, long history of the Anthropoideae, the primates, monkeys and apes and people, the naked apes, 
who've been feasting on the delicious fruits of these trees for millions of years, affecting what grew where through natural selection by selecting the most wonderful flavors and shapes and colors in an ever more joyous co-evolutionary dance. Think of it. Just as we can see that the more trees there were and the wider the diversity of those trees, the better things were for everybody, we can also see that the more primates there were and the greater their diversity, the better things were. Why? Because as I learned in 1985, when following orangutans and gibbons around the rainforest and living and hunting and gathering with the Malayu tribes people, we primates made that rainforest. Every time we ate a durian and spit out the seeds or swallowed a papaya seed and pooped it out, we were planting a new grove of trees. We added value by passing some pits through our stomach acids to start dissolving the seed coat and stimulating the germination and leaving it behind with a deposit of nutritious poop. The big trees with the giant tasty fruit and the big seeds are there because we, humans and hominoids, apes and monkeys, afforested the world with them. Okay, it wasn't just us, not just the primates. Avocados didn't evolve with us. They evolved with the Megatherium, the giant sloths of the Americas who perished 12,000 years ago, quote, during the Quaternary Extinction Event, which also claimed most other large mammals in the New World, end quote. Some scholars believe that they were wiped out by some members of the Native Americans who crossed that land bridge into the Americas 16,500 years ago. But it took them four millennia for them and the others to be pushed over the edge. And in that time, forests were planted, forests with trees that today give us our guacamole in which the human survivors of the quaternary kept replanting. At least we got part of it right in the West. And in the Eastern Hemisphere, where the biggest of our kind co-evolved and made our home, we've had a lot of time to get it right, to flourish. We and 19 other species of apes, 13 in the lesser apes, 6 in the great apes, have the potential to get it right again. But we have to tell the right stories to one another. The scholar Yuval Harari, in his opus Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, reminds us that there used to be at least nine different species of human beings until about 10,000 years ago. Now, there's a representative article of the story we now tell ourselves about this phenomenon by Nick Longrich, the senior lecturer in paleontology and evolutionary biology at the University of Bath. And this was published in The Conversation in 2019 and then republished in the National Post but it, it spreads its memes that are actually made from monarchy messaging and monocultural perspectives far and wide, and I think is the wrong story to tell. The article stated, quote, nine human species walked the earth 300,000 years ago when Gigantopithecus went extinct. Now there's just one. The Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, were stocky hunters adapted to Europe's cold steppes. The related Denisovans inhabited Asia, while the more primitive Homo erectus lived in Indonesia, and Homo rhodesiensis in Central Africa. Several short, small-brained species survived alongside them. Homo naledi in South Africa, Homo luzonensis in the Philippines, Homo floresiensis hobbits in Indonesia, and the mysterious red deer cave people in China. Now, we aren't easily able to bring back the species of humans and apes that some members of our species drove extinct, but we can reintegrate with those that remain. Notice I keep saying the species some of us drove extinct. I say this because when you read the popular press on extinctions, the conclusion almost always is that we, Homo sapiens, are the bad guys, the, the villains in the story, all of us. Longrich's article is a perfect example. It goes on to say that of the nine species of humans that inhabited the East, quote, by 10,000 years ago, they were all gone. The disappearance of these other species resembles a mass extinction, he says. But there's no obvious environmental catastrophe, volcanic eruptions, climate change, asteroid impact, driving it. Instead, he says, the extinction's timing suggests they were caused by the spread of a new species evolving 260,000 to 350,000 years ago in southern Africa, Homo sapiens, end quote. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but I think storytellers who are basically descendants of global empire building have taken it too far. The existence of forest peoples living alongside other monkeys and apes for the past 10,000 years, maintaining a hunter-gatherer lifestyle until this day, maintaining their forest, maintaining the other big primates, 
the other orang hutans, an Indonesian word that literally means men of the forest, suggests that the story told by the fictional gorilla in Daniel Quinn's Ishmael, which I alluded to in a previous module, may be a better version of what happened. Remember that Quinn's fictional gorilla, his gorilla observer, tells us that there were two mentalities that competed for representation in the world of Homo sapiens, that of the leavers and that of the takers. The lever mentality, a sustainability mentality that says, don't take more than you can use and leave enough for the system to regenerate, was associated with forest dwellers in general and forest people in particular. The taker mentality seems associated with the grasslands and really it seems most associated with grain agriculture which curiously started about 10,000 years ago. Coincidence? I mean, look at it from 30,000 feet, from a bird's eye view. You have a new species of hominid evolving around 300,000 years ago in Southern Africa, us, spreading all over the Eastern Hemisphere. And then about 288,000 years ago, we helped drive the eight other species of humans, to say nothing of so many of the other apes and charismatic megafauna, extinct too. We're playing with big numbers here, relative to our impact. Here's an abstract from a 2018 article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Quote, Anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens, AMH, began spreading across Eurasia from Africa and adjacent Southwest Asia about 50,000 to 55,000 years ago, 50 to 55 Ka. Some have argued that human genetic fossil and archaeological data indicate one or more prior dispersals, possibly as early as 120,000 years ago. A recently reported age estimate of 65,000 years ago for Majid Bebe, an archaeological site in northern Sahul, Pleistocene Australia, New Guinea, if correct, offers what might be the strongest support yet presented for a pre-55,000 year old African AMH exodus. That's anatomically modern human, AMH. So we're supposed to believe that AMH humans, anatomically modern humans, are ipso facto extinction hazards when we mostly coexisted with the other forest denizens for some 50,000 years? What was it that really happened 10 to 12,000 years ago that can better account for the anthropogenic landscape changes and extinctions? Isn't it obvious, since it's the same thing that's driving extinction and climate change today? Agriculture. But since the people telling the story of man as villain all come from cultures that believe that agriculture is the big sin qua non, sin driving civilization and its discontents, and that no seriously civilized homo sapien can think of living without it, these narrators tell the story as if all of us were implicated. Longrich's article is worth mining for its assumptions and the deconstruction of its arguments. He says, quote, the spread of modern humans out of Africa has caused a sixth mass extinction. He asserts a greater than 40,000 year event extending from the disappearance of the Ice Age mammals to the destruction of rainforest by civilization today. But were other humans the first casualties? End quote. Well sure I say, but not of all of us, just as you and I didn't give the order to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki or put our knee on George Floyd's neck. Yet Longrich and perfect British imperial tradition continues with quote, we are a uniquely dangerous species. We hunted woolly mammoths, ground sloths, and moas to extinction. We destroyed plains and forests for farming, modifying over half the planet's land area. We altered the planet's climate. We, but we are the most dangerous to other human populations because we compete for resources and land, end quote. Well, Longrich might. The British Empire certainly did. But aren't you a little tired of being blamed for what a few greedy, rich, and powerful bastards did? I'm not saying some of us may not have benefited from it. We certainly did, and so we bear some of the guilt. But that doesn't warrant concluding that all of humanity is bad and can't get past the atrocities that some of our ancestors committed. Longrich observes, quote, History is full of examples of people warring, displacing, and wiping out other groups over territory, from Rome's destruction of Carthage to the American conquest of the West and the British colonization of Australia. There have also been recent genocides and ethnic cleansings in Bosnia, Rwanda, Iraq, Darfur, and Myanmar. 
like language or tool use, a capacity for and tendency to engage in genocide is arguably an intrinsic, instinctive part of human nature. Whoa. He says, there's little reason to think that early Homo sapiens were less territorial, less violent, less intolerant, less human. History is full of examples of people's warring, displacing, and wiping out other groups over territory, end quote. But while this is all true, it always seems to me to be a way to get us all to admit complicity in the worst of the human story. My observation is that most of us, and I do mean the vast majority, are marvelous caretakers and stewards of nature and one another. Look at nurses and conservationists. Look at the hundreds of women of the Indian Chipko movement who risked their lives literally to hug trees and keep their forests from being cut down. And then Longrich does one of the most infuriating things that a pessimist agriculturalist can do. He starts in on Rousseau's noble savage concept, saying, quote, Optimists have painted early hunter-gatherers as peaceful, noble savages and have argued that our culture, not our nature, creates violence. But field studies, historical accounts, and archaeology all show that war in primitive cultures was intense, pervasive, and lethal. Neolithic weapons such as clubs, spears, axes, and bows, combined with guerrilla tactics like raids and ambushes, were devastatingly effective. Violence was the leading cause of death among men in these societies, and wars saw higher casualty levels per person than World Wars I and II. Old bones and artifacts show this violence in ancient, is ancient. The 9,000-year-old Kennewick man from North America has a spear point embedded in his pelvis. The 10,000-year-old Naturik, Naturik site in Kenya documents the brutal massacre of at least 27 men, women, and children, end quote. Of course, we don't know the context of these massacres, except to suppose that these incredible new weapons gave bullies then, who were always in the minority, disproportionate power, particularly over women and children. I don't think anybody anymore seriously suggests that one group of humans is biologically different from any other. We are, after all, the only remaining species of human, and we all have the ability to be brutal, selfish killers. The question is, who among us is willing to go down that road, and why and when? Longreach doesn't get into those crucial subtleties. Instead, he starts to universalize drawing from our ape cousins, saying, quote, it's unlikely that the other human species were much more peaceful. The existence of cooperative violence in male chimps suggests that war predates the evolution of humans. Neanderthal skeletons show patterns of trauma consistent with warfare, but sophisticated weapons likely gave Homo sapiens a military advantage. The arsenal of early Homo sapiens probably included, he says, projectile weapons like javelins and spear throwers, throwing sticks and clubs, end quote. Well, he obviously didn't pay much attention to Jane Goodall's observations. Why should he? He's a male beneficiary of the British Empire's violence, and she is a British female who dared to assert her view of nature. And what she saw when she first observed warfare in the chimps at Gombe, where she did her life's work, was that when the matriarch, of the troop. Flo died. Flo, who had kept the peace for over a generation, then the rivalries between young males erupted into savagery that she was no longer there to control. One can suppose that happened in human societies too, when matriarchal figures of balance were no longer able to influence the tribe. We see it in the archaeological records of the fall of the artistic matriarchal civilization of Minoa after earthquake, after an earthquake, and the replacement by patriarchal barbarians from the mainland. Ecological systems are complex and produce behavioral flexibility that allows for violence if deemed necessary. Now, you know the story about which wolf wins, don't you? It's worth retelling here to create a different framing of the argument. Quote, one evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, The battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, Which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. 
But unlike the old Cherokee, Longreach wants to push his point. That is, after all, the way rhetoric works, right? So the old Englishman, whose people killed off the Cherokees, continues feeding his big bad wolf story, saying, quote, complex tools and culture would also have helped us efficiently harvest a wider range of animals and plants, feeding larger tribes and giving our species a strategic advantage in numbers, end quote. He doesn't explain, notice, that complex tools and culture, by helping us efficiently harvest a wider range of animals and plants, could also enable us to co-evolve with a wider and more diverse range, producing even more complex and self-reinforcing agroforestry and silvopastoral ecologies through permaculture so that there will be less pressure on any individual species. He also doesn't mention how, in the East, the Chinese for centuries simply refused to use gunpowder for guns, restricting its use for ceremonial fireworks. Having a tool doesn't always mean using it for bad aims. And in what I find to be the true smoking gun in his imperialist at of his imperialist attitude, he concludes his article with what he calls, quote, the ultimate weapon, culture, communication. The very things that enable us to cooperate with other people and other species and create permaculture, but he calls it the ultimate weapon. Nice. Not. To a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Those who profited from the use of gunpowder as a weapon, those who profited from what Jared Diamond called guns, germs, and steel for conquest, always see communication and strategy as weapons. And art, music, and thinking are somehow nefarious tools of propaganda, according to Longrich. These are all things we devote our Envisioning Sustainability course here at PCGS to unpacking. So I encourage you to take that and discuss this with us. Longrich writes, quote, but cave paintings, carvings, and musical instruments hint at something far more dangerous, a sophisticated capacity for abstract thought and communication, the ability to cooperate, plan, strategize, manipulate, and deceive may have been our ultimate weapon. The incompleteness of the fossil record makes it hard to test these ideas, but in Europe, the only place with a relatively complete archaeological record, fossils show that within a, within a few thousand years of our arrival, Neanderthals vanished. Traces of Neanderthal DNA in some Eurasian people prove we didn't just replace them after they went extinct. We met, and we made it. Elsewhere, DNA tells of other encounters with archaic humans. East Asian, Polynesian, and Australian groups have DNA from Denisovans, DNA from another species. Possibly Homo erectus occurs in many Asian people. African genomes show traces of DNA from yet another archaic species. The fact that we interbred with these other species proves that they disappeared only after encountering us. But why would our ancestors, he asks, wipe out their relatives, causing a mass extinction, or perhaps more accurately, a mass genocide, end quote. Well, the answer, he opines in that typically self-deprecating, almost self-loathing way that the British Empire took from its appropriation of the original sin in the holy books they learned more and more about on their crusades to the Middle East to secure their supplies and trade routes for sugar and wheat and spices, quote, lies in population growth. That's what he writes. It's about population growth. He says, humans reproduce exponentially, like all species. Unchecked, we historically doubled our numbers every 25 years. And once humans became cooperative hunters, we had no predators. Without predation controlling our numbers and little family planning beyond delayed marriage and infanticide, populations grew to exploit the available resources, end quote. Now, he never mentions that, like all species, means that the other apes and the trees and the shrubs and the fruits and vegetables and all the other animals and plants and life forms were also reproducing exponentially, doubling their numbers in lockstep with us when we worked together permaculturally. He never talks about how the microbes and worms and insects and birds and mammals and amphibians and fungi and reptiles also grew to exploit the available resources and that some of those resources were human poop filled with fruit seeds, and some of those resources were our organic flesh and blood bodies which decayed into new forest soil, like all the other animals, and that some of those resources were the fruits of our labor, the things we could do with our hands to actually plant more trees and build terraces to stop erosion and accumulate and sequester carbon. Instead, he tells a just-so story, particular to people of the middle latitudes of Europe and the Middle East, but curiously not told even by Eskimos to say nothing of hunter-gatherers. Quote, he says, 
Further growth or food shortages caused by drought, harsh winters, or over-harvesting resources would inevitably lead tribes into conflict over food and foraging territory. Warfare became a check on population growth, perhaps the most important one. Our elimination of other species probably wasn't a planned, coordinated effort of the sort practiced by civilizations, but a war of attrition. The end result, however, was just as final. Raid by raid, ambush by ambush, valley by valley, modern humans would have worn down their enemies and taken their land, end quote. That's the story of bullies told by the descendants of bullies and universalized to make it seem that we're all bullies. Only in the last two paragraphs does he begin to reveal the flaws in his totalizing discourse. He states, quote, Yet the extinction of Neanderthals at least took a long time, thousands of years. This was partly because early Homo sapiens lacked the advantages of later conquering civilizations, large numbers supported by farming and epidemic diseases like smallpox, flu, and measles that devastated their opponents. But while Neanderthals lost the war, to hold on so long, they must have fought and won many battles against us, suggesting a level of intelligence close to our own. Today, we look up at the stars and we wonder if we are alone in the universe. In fantasy and science fiction, we wonder what it might be like to meet other intelligent species like us, but not us. It's profoundly sad to think that we once did, and now because of it, they're gone." End quote. Well, it is profoundly true and profoundly sad that bullies have prevailed throughout so much of recent history, making it look like they always will. But hidden in the author's lament is what I believe to be the key to turning this all around. Notice he says, supported by farming and epidemic diseases. But we know today that those are twin horrors joined at the hip and that both are the consequence of reducing biodiversity and allowing monocultures of certain plants, animals, and microbes to get out of balance in the ecological system. The antidote, therefore, seems quite simple. Stop farming. Stop cutting down trees. Stop all monoculture and return to or go forward to permaculture and tell a different story as Disney Imagineer and futurist Doe Tankersley entreats his, in his book Reimagining Tomorrow, making sure our future doesn't suck. Use the ultimate weapon of culture and communication to normalize permaculture and cooperation with biodiversity. If it's so powerful and ultimate, this weapon of culture, then ultimately it can be used for tremendous good. Bring back all the monkeys and apes and other charismatic megafauna who can't help but plant trees and sow food by their activities. As my former professor, the Harvard evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson, points out over and over again, praise and work with diversity. Praise biodiversity, cultural diversity. And we can put Humpty Dumpty together again. You know, you know you have it in you. You know we have it in us. It all depends on which wolf, well, which ape we feed.